It was so close, so close to having a guy in a wheelchair I could really identify with. And then they made him the dink in the last five minutes. You were the chosen one! Son of a bitch! <sighs> you know what? I shouldn't be too upset. He was a well-written character, and I can totally believe that he'd erase Maeve's messages at the end like he did. I was worried when we were first introduced to him early in the season. He didn't do much at all till episodes 5 and on, and it was looking like we were going to have Chekhov's wheelchair on our hands. I mean, you don't introduce a guy in a wheelchair and not use him. But they eventually did, to a fantastic degree. And in a show with so many solid characters already, it was quite impressive to see them nail a new one with a severe disability. Watching him fuck with Maeve and Amy was pure gold. This is my friend Isaac. Hiya Isaac. Why are you in a wheelchair? Dave Snow. It's fine. It was a horrendous incident involving the winds. Fuck off. So yeah, Isaac was a great addition to the show. And what's even better is that he gave us an ending that begs for and necessitates a season 3. Any character that manages that is a-okay with me. And what a sad yet endearing ending it was. Our main characters love each other, and they are all aware of each other's love to varying degrees. But love, however, is never that easy. Eric and Adam are finally together, but Eric had to hurt Raheem to do it, and Adam is still unsure if he can even love himself. Jean is just as damaged as Otis's father Remy, it seems, as her inability to maintain a healthy relationship pushed Yakov away whilst becoming pregnant with his child. Remy, despite loving Otis and Jean, still cannot free himself from an addiction to sex. An addiction that continues to ruin his life and yet tragically be the source of his success. And then there is Otis and Maeve, our main characters who are destined to be together but somehow still can't find their way to one another. It's harder than it looks, making the will they won't they dynamic work. And I applaud Lori Nunn and the writing team for making it seem as natural and sensical as it does. Maintaining the relationship between the two of them for 16 hours worth of storytelling and reaching a point where they love each other but still aren't ready to be together cannot be understated. Sure, I will admit there is a few minor examples of contrivance. Maeve leaving her phone unattended with Isaac right after Isaac finds out about Otis's message is definitely convenient. But I can forgive these things because what the characters are doing makes sense given the convenience. Contrivance needs to be earned. And for the most part, sex education absolutely earns it. A few examples where it didn't? Let's see. Uh, how about Jean telling a boy that her friend could possibly have a ghost fetish? Okay, sorry, but that joke was not funny enough for me to get past the idea that a professional would tell a 15 year old boy that a ghost fetish could be involved. It didn't work for me and it's made even worse when she gives outstanding advice to other students just a couple scenes later. There was one line that felt very political, almost to a pandering degree. Statistically, two thirds of girls experience unwanted sexual tension or contact in public spaces before the age of 21. Yeah, that one. I'm sorry, but what? If we're going to use terms like unwanted sexual tension, I'm willing to bet a very large majority of people on the planet experience unwanted sexual tension at some point in their lives. Hell, I'm a dude in a wheelchair, even I've experienced unwanted sexual attention from women I wasn't interested in. You don't get to attach statements like that to sexual contact and make it seem like two thirds of women are being molested and assaulted. It's not fair or honest. I don't know how or where they got this statistic, and I tried looking into it myself with no concrete numbers coming anywhere close to that. You're better than that show, and luckily that line was really the only dog whistle to speak of because Amy's sexual assault storyline was otherwise really well done. The last thing that kind of bothered me? Jackson's pressure to succeed in swimming from his non-biological mother. I'm sorry, but we probably got a dozen scenes of him and his mother doing the same thing over the last two seasons. Ignoring Jackson's obvious contention with swimming. The self-harming that Jackson committed gave the storyline a bit more life, but even with that I was really starting to get irritated with how repetitive it was and how it ultimately took a simple conversation to get it over with. I would have much rather seen more interactions with Jackson and Otis or Maeve, 
He never really got over Maeve, and he still resents Otis tremendously. But we got maybe two quick scenes involving those dynamics? Why? So much wasted potential there for sure. I feel I should reiterate that these are all minor issues, and I still believe it was a pretty great sophomore season of Sex Education. In many ways, even better than the first. Thanks to a closer examination of Otis and Maeve's parents, I have an even greater appreciation for the leads, and I didn't think that was possible. Any show that continues to breathe new life and love into my favorite characters, whilst delivering legendary masturbation montages, is one that deserves your time and attention. And come on, who wouldn't laugh at a modern interpretation of Romeo and Juliet involving tentacle dick monsters? 8 Tentacle Dick Aliens out of 10